Okay, so uh, my name is Joel Fernandez. I uh, spent like uh, the last couple of months working on some interesting uh, real-time issues, and uh, as I was debugging them, I, you know, I, I found different ways to debug them, and I thought it would be really useful to share some of those experiences. So this talk is uh, uh, really like uh, kind of like a recipe-driven uh, type of talk. So I show you problems, and I show you the tools that I used, and and these are like real problems that I, they're not like fake examples or something, like these are real issues, so I thought that would be really useful. <coughs> so, um, yeah, uh, so I, uh, I used to work for Amazon like until a few weeks ago, now I work for Google, and my uh, responsibilities are like Android performance and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, this is like how I felt a lot. Uh, like you fix issues and then they show up after like 24 hours or 48 hours and you run a test and uh, you know, like uh, sometimes uh, you think you fix something but you didn't really do, do anything. Uh, you know, it's, it's like all about having the, like sometimes all the ducks line up and bad things happen and, and really rare, uh, those uh, occurrences are really rare. Um, so for the purpose of my talk, uh, I'd like to make some definitions. So like period is uh, the time interval uh, between which RT tasks will be released at a fixed rate, and deadline is uh, uh, when that RT task is expected to finish responding. And for periodic real-time tasks like audio, uh, period and deadline are the same thing. So I'm going to start off with like some basic concepts. Uh, and then we'll go into the real issues, uh, the categories of issues, and uh, how to, you know, the tools I use to, to find the issues and fix them. Uh, yeah, so this is what, it, this is what uh, a periodic real-time task would look like. Like you have a task uh, waking up every uh, period uh, time interval, and then it's expected to finish uh, execution by the end of that period. And you have issues like, uh, where the task has, uh, like you can see here, it has uh, some scheduling delays, uh, jitter uh, that happens uh, when it actually gets the CPU from the time it's woken up. And you also have the task taking a long time. Once it does get CPU, it, uh, it takes a long time because it's not well written or something, and it, uh, it misses its uh, deadlines that way. And then you have a combination of both those. You can have jitter and, uh, and, the, and the long execution time causing... Uh, uh, issues. Uh, so, uh, so I wanted to briefly go over the, all the delays, the possible delays uh, that that you can face. So, uh, in this example, I have a task two that is responding to an interrupt two, and it has to finish responding. Uh, and uh, what you have here is you have some hardware delays. As soon as you get the the interrupt signal, you have some propagation delay. Uh, you know, the interrupt control has to register that all of that. And then in this example, I have an, another interrupt that was already running on CPU. So um, you, uh, in Linux, uh, interrupts are, cannot be nested. You cannot have uh, a top half interrupt uh, interrupting another one. So the interrupt has to, even though the signal was received, it has to, it has to wait for the previous interrupt to finish. And that's what I call IRQs off delays. And then Finally, uh, the interrupt two gets a chance to run there, but uh, the interrupt itself takes time to run, so I call that IS ISR execution delays, interrupt service routine execution delays. And then the interrupt, uh, it, it wakes up the task and puts it on the CPU, but uh, for it to actually get the CPU, it, it, needs to, uh, it needs to contend with other tasks. So in this case, I have task one that's higher priority, so task two has to wait for uh, task one to finish. And I call that scheduler delays. And then finally, task two gets a chance to run. Finally, after all this delays, and then it, ha it takes time on its own to, to run. So I call that task response delay. So you have all these delays together that add up and, and introduce latency. Uh, usually, the scheduler delays are, are, are the biggest. Uh, and then in this picture, I try to show like uh, preemption of delays. So you had a task that turned off preemption. And uh, uh, you know you have the so here you have task one responding to interrupt one, and task two was uh, was already running and uh, it turned off preemption, and then 
the interrupt one came in and you have the regular hardware delays and the interrupt service routine delays. But then after the task uh, woke up and was uh, assigned CPU, it can still cannot run because task two has turned off preemption. And so you have the preemption of delays. And finally, when it re-enables preemption, because task one, uh, task one is higher priority than task two, it'll get CPU, but it had to wait for preemption to be enabled. So you have those preemption delays as well. Um, and then you, uh, in this picture, I try to show a delay where a CPU uh, took a long time to wake up from idle. Uh, so uh, you know, for, to service and interrupt, CPU might be in a deep sleep state and has to wake up from that. And that has, that has delays too. Uh, so you can see here, uh, all this time was taken for CPU to actually come back into a running state. And, and, and uh, usually that's not, uh, that's not high, but it can introduce latency. And if you, especially if you have hardware bugs with the CPU waking up, uh, maybe a power rail has to be uh, toggled or something. Uh, I've seen issues where that adds latency too. And we'll go over that. Uh, so a quick mention that interrupt, uh, if you don't have threaded interrupts in Linux, uh, in, uh, interrupt, executing interrupt context is, cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, preempted uh, by anyone. It's, it cannot, another interrupt cannot come in and run. It has to finish running and then the next one will get a chance to run. And the reason they did that was uh, you had these interrupts, uh, interrupting interrupts over and over and then you had like stack overflows and stuff like that, which was a pain. So they, they just said like, let's just, not do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, a quick mention that if you do something like this in your driver, then you can really piss a lot of people off. Uh, uh, like if you disable preemption or something for no reason. Um, uh, as I showed you earlier in the pictures, disabling preemption for a long time introduced latency. Um, and the RT patch set goes to a great deal of uh, uh, great, it does a, a lot of work to make sure that that doesn't happen. So your spin locks and all those things are not, uh, uh, don't disable preemption as in the non-RT, uh, in the non-RT world. Uh, and uh, if you actually have to disable preemption, a, a lot of paths in the kernel actually check if, the, uh, if there's something higher priority that needs CPU. And then if it needs CPU, it, it re-enables preemption. Uh, and uh, uh, there's ways to also, uh, uh, there are APIs that you can use to check if uh, uh, th there's uh, something that needs CPU and then if it does, then you release the lock. So there's, there's all kinds of tricks like that that the driver can uh, implement to uh, actually uh, make sure that uh, turning off preemption for a long time, it's not, it doesn't harm the system. So the, uh, the RT path set, uh, St Steven walked in at the right time. Uh, the RT path set actually con um, converts spin locks to RT spin lock, uh, uh, which uh, doesn't really turn off preemption. Um, spin lock critical sections are preemptable uh, if you have the RT path set and you have the preempt RT config option. Mutexes are actually uh, uh, converted to uh, RT mutex, which has priority inheritance support and stuff like that. And uh, all IRQ top halves are force threaded. So, uh, you know, if you ha if you had an interrupt handler and you, you said and you use config preempt RT for it force threaded threads everything. Like all the top halves that were executing in interrupt context previously are actually forced to run in threads. Um, so the the idea is that you you don't want to run things with interrupts turned off, and you want, uh, you want to run your handler uh, such that it can be preempted. So this talk is not really about the RT paths or its features. It's, uh, it's really about debugging and some of the tools I used uh, and stuff like that. So the, the three uh, categories of real-time issues I wanted to discuss, uh, kernel, application, and hardware. Kernel is I'll show you some examples. Uh, preemption is turned off, IRQ is turned off, uh, spin locks are used where not necessary, stuff like that. Um, and RT patch really fixes a lot of those things. And then you have application and hardware issues. Uh, application issues are like, uh, uh, you know, application takes too much time to run when it's given CPU. Uh, you have compiler issues where 
the code is not optimal, uh, you know, uh, this the code that's that's running in user space has a lot of cache misses, uh, page faults, stuff like that. Uh, CPU frequency is not correct, and I show you an issue where CPU frequency is not correct, and the task was actually uh, missing its deadline. Uh, use the wrong scheduling priority uh, the policy and stuff like that. Uh, and then I'll talk about hardware issues where uh, the interp handler was trying to access the bus, and the bus was like taking too much time. I'll show you some real issues I saw. And uh, as I was saying, CPU uh, wake up from idle. Uh, an interrupt uh, has been received, but CPU takes a long time to to uh, come back into running state, and so the interrupt cannot interrupt handler cannot run soon enough. Uh, so we start off with the IRQs off and preempts off issues uh, I saw, found in the kernel. Uh, so the idea is that uh, inter interrupts disabled on local CPU for too long uh, has the effect of locking the CPU to other tasks and other interrupts. Because, um, like, if if an interrupt is received and it has to wake up a task, it, it cannot do that if it doesn't get a chance to run. And then you have the preemption uh, disabled uh, issues in in the kernel that you can have that if some um, if something is uh, is woken up, it can, it still cannot run because uh, preemption is turned off. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, some uh, so the first example I want to show you the IRQs off was like, uh, and this is without the RT patch set. This is just like a regular kernel. And uh, uh, we ran the, uh, so I wanted to talk about the IRQs off tracer. So it's really cool. It, uh, as soon as you turn off interrupts in the kernel, it starts uh, counting, uh, you know, the start time. And then uh, it, uh, when you turn back interrupts on, it, uh, takes, on a, it uh, takes another time stamp. And then uh, it knows uh, how much time elapsed. So it keeps track of what was the maximum uh, ever, you know, the interrupts were turned off. What was the maximum time? And that helps you find these kind of issues. And by default, it also traces functions between those two points. So you can actually see w what the hell was kernel doing and, uh, you know, what functions were executed, which gives you a lot of insight into what might be taking time. So in this case, it's... Uh, um, it's not the function trace I'm showing you, but it's it's just uh, this is just a stack trace when the uh, interrupts were actually turned back on. So it, it gives you a stack trace. Uh, I'll show you uh, the actual function traces a little later. Um, and th this particular example, uh, again, this is non-RT uh, kernel. Uh, spin lock IRQ save actually turns off the uh, it flips a bit in the CPU that masks all interrupts. So if you have, like, uh, say, device one's uh, interrupt handler uh, did a spin lock RQ save, uh, and device two uh, generated an interrupt, then it just, uh, you know, uh, device two's interrupt handler will not run because of device one. So what you may want to do is instead of doing spin lock IRQ save, just do spin lock and, and disable IRQ, which will just turn off the interrupt line here and not uh, disturb this guy. So you, you just turn this off, and that might serve the purpose, which we did in one of our products. So something like this we did. Um, and with the, with the preempt RT full config option, uh, you know, spin lock RQ save uh, API does not disable interrupts, which is really cool. Uh, the API is named the same because uh, you want to, like, use the same drivers with uh, preempt RT uh, full. Uh, and it, it, the driver shouldn't have to worry about uh, using a different API for RT with non-RT. So spin lock RQ save gets converted into a, a mutex, and it does not disable interrupts. Uh, but if you use raw spin lock RQ save, that will still revert to the old behavior because you have to. Uh, you may have instances where you may need it. And then second example is uh, top has taking long time. Again, these are like non-threaded. Uh, this is the non-threaded handler. If you use threaded IRQs, uh, then they, they still run as threads. But in, in the case of non-threaded uh, uh, handlers, the interrupt, as I said, there's no nesting support. So if, they, if the handler takes a long time to run, then it keeps interrupts off for the whole duration of that, of that time. And Linux doesn't support nesting of those. It's, it's not uh, uh, available. So. Uh, yeah, so one way to, uh, to find this is to use function graph tracer. I'll show you some tricks later that you can, um, 
you can use to, uh, to narrow down uh, even further. But this was kind of like I did a function graph trace on, on, on the whole uh, system, and I happened to see that handle IRQ event was taking three milliseconds there. Uh, function graph tracer nicely uh, shows you uh, 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 the total time. Yeah, yes. Uh, when you do those traces like that, uh, since function graph has a high overhead, yeah. uh, always to get the actual um, time for that, you want to just filter like yeah. the IQ Yeah, yeah, I'll be, sh I'll be showing that next. Yeah. Uh, so it turns out that, uh, that uh, after a lot of debugging, we found that the, ice, the handler that was actually taking a long time was from audio, and it was trying to access the bus. Uh, and it was taking a long time. Um, and the, as Steven was saying, there are some tricks you can use to uh, using filters and stuff like that. So uh, one nice trick I, I found was uh, you can just uh, run function graph tracer on handle IRQ event and say uh, set the depth to three and, uh, uh, and show me everything that took greater than one millisecond. And uh, it'll show you something like this. So just looking at that, you can, uh, you can easily see across the whole system which interrupt handlers took a long time. Uh, and this wasn't actually working. Uh, uh, I, I fixed that, uh, I think, uh, two months back, where if, it was like if you, set up, if you, if you used uh, the thresholds, like one millisecond, then it would just uh, trace everything and it would, it would ignore a lot of things. Um, so is that, does that answer? Okay. That's still kind of high. What yeah. I'm suggesting is um, just to go set the set F trace filter. Okay, so but, but the thing is you still don't know like which uh, interrupt handlers you, like you don't know the names of the of these guys, right? So you, you can't really filter on them, right? What I'm saying is what I would do is when you find, you do this first and then filter it down to see if that's actually, if it's F trace overhead or if it's. Oh, okay. And then narrow down and, and uh, yeah, okay. Cool, yeah. So after, uh, what Steven's saying is like after you see something like that, then take the individual functions and then set F trace filter uh, on those so that nothing else is traced but, but just that. I think there's a nice L trick on LW and you showed where you enabled, uh, uh, you, were, you were tracing do IRQ and then you uh, enabled the IRQ entry event, uh, which, can, which is also really cool. Uh, and then the uh, other trick that, that you can use is k-ret probe. So you, you do the same thing you did with function graph tracer on hand, handle IRQ event. Uh, so the idea is that you, you can dynamically insert probe points in the kernel. And with k-ret probes, you insert both a beginning and an endpoint. And uh, what I did is in the, in the entry point, you, uh, your k-probe is called with the same arguments that handle IRQ event is called with. So you can actually take those arguments, the IRQ descriptor, and actually find out which function uh, is, is about to be, uh, which handler is about to be called. And then at exit, you can take another timestamp, and then you can take the difference between the two timestamps, and then if, uh, if it's too high, you can warn. And, and here's some code that uh, this is the entry handler. Uh, basically, I, I take a timestamp, and I store the, uh, the function, uh, the handler, the, the symbol name of the, of the handler. And in my return, I take another timestamp, and then if, if uh, it took a long time, then I just scream that it took, it took too long. And this is some boilerplate to actually set up the uh, K-Pro on the handle IRQ event. I mean, you, you, you do that, and you see something like this, uh, which shows you like uh, nicely in the kernel logs uh, all the interrupt handlers that uh, took a long time. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the recommendations are, my recommendation is use threaded IRQ uh, as much as possible with preempt RT patch set, with the RT patch set uh, and preempt RT full, uh, like all interrupts are threaded. So uh, you, you won't run into the problems hopefully that I, I just showed. And you can use the techniques I showed you to time your IRQ events using function graph trace or k-probes. Uh, and uh, as Steven said, with function graph trace, you probably want to set the filters. Uh, and this third example is the uh, 8250 driver uh, on one of the products I worked on, which uh, 
the serial console prints actually uh, in an older kernel. It was actually disabling interrupts like that. And then uh, it was sending all the characters down the uh, serial, uh, serial port. And uh, it, it actually disabled interrupts. And then it uh, did that. I'm thinking it did that because you didn't want messages, overlapping messages. Uh, but that's what it was doing. And uh, the possible solutions for this are, like, of course, like try not to print anything uh, unnecessary. Uh, in our final product, we disable uh, we disable the serial console completely uh, for security reasons as well. So we, we fixed it that way. But the the, the real fix was the, made by Ingo Molnar, where he uh, converted the uh, local IRQ save that I just showed you into a spin lock IRQ save. And uh, uh, and and the idea is that uh, if you use config preempt RT full and you say since spinlock RQ save, that's still okay because it won't disable interrupts. So it, that fixed the issue. Uh, but you have to uh, have the RT patch set and you have to enable preempt RT full uh, to, to actually fix those kind of issues. Uh, so I want to briefly talk about the preempt RQ soft tracer. It's like the RQ soft tracer, but it starts tracing uh, when you either, enable, uh, either disable uh, preemption or you disable interrupts. And it stops tracing uh, when you enable, uh, when both are enabled. So that kind of takes care of both the cases. And then you can see the function trace of the, of the maximum latency that, that happened. Um, so this is a real issue. Uh, this is another issue that uh, I'm working on right now in the upstream kernel. Uh, basically, you'll have this uh, VMalloc uh, v, uh, VMAP stuff. Uh, it's uh, used to. Uh, create um, uh, virtual mappings in the uh, VMLOC space. And uh, this code actually has this mechanism called lazy free, lazy free VMAP. So uh, when you map something, it creates, a, it creates a, a, a virtual memory map. But when you free it, it actually doesn't like destroy, destroy the mapping. Uh, and uh, after it crosses a certain point, like uh, it, I think it's like 32 megabytes times the number of CPUs, if the threshold crosses that, then, it's, then it actually starts, uh, uh, starts destroying the mappings. Uh, and it, it does the whole thing with spin locks, uh, uh, with, with spin lock and spin unlock, which for non-RT, uh, again, like turns off preemption. And so uh, this issue, uh, uh, the way we worked around it was we uh, reduced the, uh, the 32 to 8, the, th the max threshold, so that when it actually starts, um, when it, when it actually gets triggered, it, it gets triggered more sooner than like waiting for 32 megabyte times the log of the number of CPUs. And preempt IRQ soft tracer nicely caught this uh, 14 millisecond there. Uh, and it, it uh, so there was a bug in the preempt IRQ soft tracer that I've, uh, with the help of Steven, we fixed that, we fixed that uh, uh, where it wasn't function tracing for uh, when, when, uh, preemption was off. It was only function tra tracing when interrupts were off. So you, you would miss all these things. But uh, once, once that was fixed, we, we could see that. And we could easily see that it was actually uh, busy in this, uh, in this loop here. Because we could see that the free VMAP area was repeatedly being called. Um, so, uh, so, see, so that's the preempt IRQs off tracer. I, I would encourage people to use that. And then a little bit about the RT patch set, what it does is, as I was saying, spin lock RQ save uh, is, doesn't turn off interrupts in, uh, in RT patch set. It gets converted to spin lock. So it, it's kind of like a trick. It doesn't really disable interrupts. And, it, it, and then it actually gets defined from spin lock to RT spin lock in the spin lock RT header file, which if I understand correctly, it, it's kind of a spinning implementation, but it sleeps while spinning. Um, so, th so that's it for kernel issues. Uh, we go into hardware issues now. So uh, uh, the hardware issues that I, I saw, uh, there, there might be many. Um, so uh, some terminology for bus accesses. So you have uh, two types of accesses that CPU can make on the bus. You have posted and non-posted. -post posted transactions don't wait for the transaction to complete. So you, you make the transaction, and then you, you, you continue. Whereas non-posted, you have to wait for the transaction to complete. Uh, and this is like the architecture of, uh, of one of the devices I saw this bus related issue on. It's an Intel Atom. Uh, and it has this, uh, just, uh, I don't want to go over everything here, but 
uh, basically it has this Silvermon system agent, which is this high speed bus, which is connected to uh, your cores, uh, your uh, memory controller, uh, and everything, the high speed stuff. And, uh, your, and then you have something called iOS stuff, which is for the, all the IO stuff like PCIe, USB uh, audio, and stuff like that. So it looks, it looks something like this. Um, and uh, 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 we, again, we use function graph tracer with depth of one. Uh, should I probably use setf trace filter uh, after uh, what, he, uh, what Steven said? But anyway, we were seeing these, uh, these huge times that, uh, that were happening in, in, the, in the Wi-Fi driver. And uh, uh, we were also seeing uh, the, uh, the earlier trace that I showed you. This, that was actually uh, a hardware issue, not a kernel issue. Uh, but it turned out to be that, that the interrupt handler in the kernel was taking a long time. But it was actually a hardware uh, access issue. So basically, audio was trying to access the bus, and it was taking forever. Um, and it turns out that there was a bug in, in the bus where uh, the bus would only support uh, one, uh, it was only support a single non-poster access. Uh, it wouldn't support like concurrent ones. So uh, what was happening was PCI, uh, the PCIe uh, bus uh, has these low power states. So it was going into a low power state and then the uh, Wi-Fi driver would, uh, uh, so the, the Wi-Fi system was using GPIO to, uh, for, for interrupts, and then the, the, uh, the Wi-Fi interrupt handler would try to access the PCIe bus. And then what was happening was, because PCIe was in a low power state, it had to uh, recover. And, and while it's recovering, that access that the Wi-Fi driver made is, uh, still, is still pending, because you can only have one outstanding uh, access in this architecture. So, um, so everyone else who accesses the iOS have had to just wait, which is horrible. Uh, so anyone want to guess what the fix was, or the workaround was? So yeah, we we just like had to uh, turn off the uh, power management on the PCI to never like go into its low power state, so that. The question of recovery would never happen, because the issue was like it was going into its low power state, and then uh, uh, accesses to the bus were taking forever. But anyway, uh, the thing the thing about the uh, like these hardware issues, you can't really like uh, mesh, uh, measure them using the kernel because they're in the hardware. You need some deeper tracing. But using function uh, graph tracer and these kind of tools, we we're able to uh, easily see that the bus was taking a long time to access. Now, why it's taking a long time, those things, you need like deeper hardware-related debugging. Uh, but uh, honestly, we, uh, we didn't really need that to, uh, we kind of saw a pattern that the bus access were taking a long time, and then we were able to uh, determine that it was the power management. And then the other issue we saw was, I uh, just want to check how we're doing on time. Okay. Um, so uh, you have this thing in the kernel called the PMQOS framework, and uh, uh, you have this thing called, uh, like, uh, different drivers and things can basically tell the kernel that I need this much of latency uh, uh, when, uh, when uh, you, you actually recover and come out of idle. So, so when there's a latency requirement change, uh, uh, a new set of uh, sleep states have to be calculated based on what the requirement is. So uh, to do that, all the cores have to be woken up because if they're not woken up, then it doesn't make sense because like they're already sleeping. So how can you change the amount of time they take to come back from a low power state? So you have to wake all of them up. And then uh, the kernel will uh, program new uh, uh, requirements for, the, for what power states, low power states they can enter. So it has to wake them up. Uh, so uh, the funny, uh, the interesting thing is that it disables preemption while uh, doing that. Um, I'll show you uh, later. And to wake it up, it actually sends IPIs to all the other cores. So it has it. Uh, it's, it's, it's called an interprocessor interrupt. That's what it, the mechanism it uses. It does something like this. So CPU idle latency notify calls SMP call function, which. Uh, 
The idea is that uh, you want to execute a function on every uh, other CPU, uh, but the function really doesn't do anything other than just returning. Uh, and it, uh, and so the, the CPU that wants to program new uh, CPU idle wake up requirements has to uh, call SMP call function many like that. Uh, all, all, and all this while preemption uh, is turned off. And uh, it's, uh, it does an IPI uh, while preemption is off. Um, and what it does is uh, it, uh, it, it, it grabs a lock uh, and it uh, does an IPI. And then the, uh, on, the, on the receiving core, the, uh, the, the lock that was grabbed on the uh, core that is making the IPI is released. And that's how the uh, core that is sending the IPI knows that the function that was supposed to run on the, on the, on the other cores have, are done. And again, uh, preempt IRQs uh, off tracing, we, uh, could ease, we could actually see that uh, we, we kind of found a pattern of like which cores are actually taking a long time to uh, release the, the lock. And uh, this first set of uh, locks, so CSD lock wait is basically a function that waits for the lock to be released. So first set of CSD locks, actually are just dummy uh, things. Uh, the, the idea is that you just want to like, uh, if, the lo if the lock is really taken, you want to wait for it to get unlocked. So those, uh, those are fine, you know, cores zero sends IPS to core one, two, and three. And uh, I'm sorry, the IPA part is later. Uh, core zero just checks the locks of one, two, and three, and they're all unlocked, and so everyone is happy. And then you can say it sends IPI there, and the first lock, uh, preempt IRQ is off tracer again, beautifully shows the problem. First lock, uh, uh, you know, returns immediately, but the second one actually takes a long time. So we enter the CSD lock weight and then we're just spinning there, waiting for, waiting for the core that the IPO was sent to to release the lock. And we wait all that time. And then you see that the next one uh, happens after 14 milliseconds there. Um, so it looks something like that. Um, and uh, we found found that we found this pattern like so it was so uh, obvious that core three was always taking a long time, and uh, you know uh, of course it, it didn't tell us how to fix the problem, but at least we knew that uh, there might be something going on there uh, that the IPI that the core receives is not able to to run the function handler is not able to run. It might be something related to being idle. <coughs> because we were trying to wake everything up. So uh, you get that insight. Um, yeah, and, and the issue turned out to be something to do with uh, uh, the, uh, the PMEC was on the same I2C bus as the, uh, as, as the I2C driver, and it's, it's just a mess. And so the, PMEC, uh, the, the I2C access was actually keeping the bus busy, and because of that, the PMIC couldn't be contacted to bring the CPU out of idle uh, in time. It's just, uh, it's just a mess. Um, so with that, we'll go to application issues. Uh, and uh, I worked on this product, really cool product, Amazon Echo. Uh, it, it does a lot of uh, things. Uh, when it receives audio, it has to do beam forming uh, to figure out where the sound is coming from. Uh, it does uh, noise cancellation and that kind of stuff. It's always listening for Alexa, and it has to respond to that. Um, and for for user space, uh, uh, since uh, this is uh, since uh, Android uh, was being used, uh, I uh, used uh, Android SysTrace, which is actually based on FTrace, and uh, it uses the FTrace trace mark facility to. Uh, insert uh, start and end uh, things like, uh, so that the application can actually make marks like I start this year and I end this year uh, using the trace mark write feature of ftrace. And so it nicely shows you uh, how much time each of the different things in the application took. Uh, and it looks, it looks something like this visually when you actually run it, run SysTrace. And so this, show, um, this show, showed us the, uh, the task here, it's like, picks up uh, every uh, now and then like to uh, read frames from outside, process them, and uh, do your beam forming and all these other algorithms. 
And uh, SysTrace nicely uh, shows you like a lot of things at the same time. So instead of going through traces, you can easily see like visually, uh, you know, what's going on. And we found a, a pattern where uh, these things correspond to uh, these things, uh, uh, you know, like kind of merging. They shouldn't like merge. They should like uh, it, it, they should execute quickly within uh, the time that they have. Otherwise, they will not ex not be able to process the next period. Uh, and and uh, the governor is like to be to blame because we were using I think it was interactive governor and it's really crap like it, uh, it it has a very short memory so it doesn't look at uh, overall uh, utilization it just looks at the last window and uh, so it's like it's like okay like there's not much uh, there's like some room to drop frequency so it drops it and then bad things happen then it and then it backs up again you can see that here. So uh, we actually had to like hack the product to uh, to have a minimum frequency and never to drop below that. Um, but I think the new governors are really good. The scared freak governor uh, uh, does take uh, utilization into account. Um, and then I, I use perf quite a lot to find issues like cache misses and stuff like that, and then report that to the algorithms team and like say, hey, you know, you have like cache misses, uh, you know, 30% of the time. Uh, I had to blur out this stuff because I didn't want to get into trouble, but uh, this is like open source and this is closed source. So, <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so this is the generic uh, Android audio pipeline. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then you have some algorithms processing here. So, you know, I had to tell them like optimize it and stuff like that. And you can have other application issues, of course. Like I did find that they were not using uh, enough parallelization to, to run the algorithm, so uh, uh, I reported that. And uh, you can have other issues uh, like, you know, page faults, uh, memory locality issues, uh, and stuff like that. And then the uh, the scheduling part. Like I wanted to go over some things uh, in the scheduler statistics that can tell you about problems. Uh, so, uh, so with, with scheduling, you should uh, design your system uh, such that you, all the priorities are correct, and the uh, and you set up your policies correctly, like scared other or uh, round robin or whatever. Um, and scared stats uh, is this uh, uh, cool feature in the kernel that can show you how much time uh, something was waiting on the run queue to get CPU. So I use that quite a bit. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so this is actually for the CFS policy. Uh, what I really wanted was to use it for RT, but uh, for for a, a round robin uh, and uh, it's zero for round robin. So it was like I was like, why is it zero? And then looked at the code and it was actually not being calculated. Uh, but then we found like some other uh, code in the in the scheduler land uh, where it, it actually calculates. The total time uh, from the beginning of time, the total time uh, something was waiting on the run queue, which doesn't really tell you the worst case time something was on, waiting, but it tells you the total. So we messed around with that code to actually uh, to uh, calculate the max if something was waiting before it got CPU, not not the to not just the total, but the, but the max, uh, and that showed us some things here. I, it was definitely more than this, but. Uh, just to show you show you that, and then I did some more tests where I, I wanted to see if uh, we need to calculate uh, delays on all the run queues before something got CPU after it was woken up. Uh, and I, I did see that I, I took Steven's uh, RT logs test and uh, I messed around with that a little bit. Uh, and, and I did see that when there are like too many RT tasks and and you have the low priority ones that are being migrated like a lot. Um, the, uh, there is a difference between calculating the delay on one run queue and and adding up the the delay on all. Um, but that that was a very rare occurrence, so I, I didn't really bother much. And then cyclic tests is a great tool to use to uh, actually uh, see how much uh, time the system takes uh, to service something. Uh, so the idea is that you you start a timer and. Uh, and uh, you take a timestamp, time and then once the, and then you go to sleep, and then 
uh, timer wakes you up, and then you uh, take another timestamp and you see how much time elapsed, how much time uh, were you supposed to be woken up, and how much time you really it really took, and the difference is the is the latency. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I'll, I'll talk more about cyclic tests, but you do have uh, something in the RT path set called latency hest, uh, which is really cool. Uh, so it, it uh, shows you a histogram of uh, all the times uh, preemption was turned off, interrupts were turned off, and uh, those are called possible latencies because uh, because uh, the, you know preemption might be turned off, but it doesn't mean something really suffered. So it's called possible. Uh, but you should, should still fix them, obviously, because you don't want to leave a problem uh, there. And then it shows you effective latencies, which is like uh, when something is woken up uh, uh, until it, it got CPU, how much t uh, time elapsed. Uh, and and uh, that's probably uh, very useful. And so I, I did a little test, like a demo, like I was running cyclic tests, and uh, I had this like uh, troublemaker kernel module that was turning off preemption, busy working and uh, doing some busy work, and then re-enabling it. And then I wanted to see whether cyclic test caught that latency, and and it, the kernel module looks like that. This is something I, I, I ask you never to do, and and unless you unless you you don't want to live very long. Uh, and then uh, I, I run that uh, kernel module in a loop like that, and. Uh, I have cyclic text running there like that. And then I, uh, you know, sooner or later, uh, uh, cyclic text catches it. Uh, but the, uh, the real reason I, want, I, I did this test was I wanted to test the latency hist stuff. And so uh, I mentioned uh, effective latencies, which is, the, um, uh, which is a histogram of, uh, of wake-up latencies that ever happened on the CPU. So it looks... Uh, Something like that. I, I skipped a lot, but it, dis, it does give you an idea. Like, what was the worst case? So you can see that uh, it's pretty close to what cyclic tests found. Uh, it, it tells it's roughly close, um, and then you can. Uh, so that's just the histogram, but it, it doesn't tell you like what, what what actually suffered. So then you have this. Uh, uh, this other file called max latency, which uh, shows you what was the what what was the what was the task that suffered the maximum. So you can see you can see that here. It shows like uh, two millisecond cyclic test suffered that latency, uh, and it also shows you uh, what was running before uh, that task got CPU, which is useful because it might give you uh, uh, an idea about uh, what was going on just in the previous uh, previous task, like which task was, was was running. And that might help you to dig in further. Uh, and then the other tools uh, that I learned about was uh, Matthew's uh, latency tracker, uh, which I, I think I'll try. Uh, Matthew's sitting right there. You can definitely, do you want to say a few words about latency uh, tracker? Yeah, should I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the fi final part is uh, so uh, user space uh, can uh, basically talk to a, a file which is work begin, work end, and they can echo or whatever write a, a, a cookie uh, to match the beginning and end of their work. So basically, you can follow the, the response time from the, the IRQ start uh, down to the, the, the end of the, the actual task. Okay. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah, I really like the per breakdown that it'll show you, like, in the whole path. Uh, and then RT, RT app um, is some something that's used to like generate like a real workload. Uh, 
I tried to use cyclic test. Uh, uh, like I, I thought cyclic test supported like uh, putting some load as well on the CPU, but I, I, uh, I think it didn't do that. Uh, and RT app does that, so that's definitely I'll, I'll check out as well. So uh, anybody, any questions? Yeah, please. Was it? Uh, yeah. Oh, was it this one? Yeah, yeah. So, what happens to the logic here? Where it does it start to trace this? Do you, do you say which functions to start to trace? Or? Yeah, so you do specify a graph function, which basically uh, tells the graph tracer that that's when it actually starts, uh, it needs to start writing into the ring buffer. Yeah, and until then, uh, until then, it's just ignoring all the functions that are uh, the functions are still being traced. Like uh, Stephen was saying, that they're uh, not there is some overhead, so you need to set uh, you need to be more specific. Um, but uh, that's how it works. Like as soon as you hit the graph function, it's uh, it starts uh, it stops ignoring every uh, all the functions that are being called and. Uh, yeah, or or if the depth has been exceeded uh, and stuff like that like you know if if the if, if you're too deep into the graph function then it it, it still ignores uh, the functions Yeah, so that, that's the whole idea. Like, this has nothing specific to a particular ISR or IRQ. That's the beauty of it. Like, you can just run this, and then it'll show you everything here. So you can see, uh, you can, and, and it filters it too, right, based on the, the one millisecond. So it'll not show you stuff you don't want to see, All right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is not uh, uh, this is not like a silver like this is not like a one size fits all type of thing. Yeah, it's you definitely have to uh, try running these tracers and see what's going on and rule out. Okay, it's not this. You know, like yeah. Any other question? Cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think if you're on the limit, uh, this tracing must cause performance. So maybe it, then you get in another trouble because it's taking too long. And yeah, you can. Uh, so you need to be very smart about like filtering and uh, making sure the overhead is low and stuff like that. Like, yeah, like just enabling function tracer. Uh, I, I, I was doing some measurements, and it drops performance by 50%. If you're not even writing anything into the ring buffer, if you just like say register f trace call or whatever, and it calls uh, your function for every function in the kernel, that itself drops performance by 50%. Okay. Uh, so it's, uh, it's but but if you if you uh, use uh, f trace filter, it, it actually uh, improves things a lot because it goes and it uh, knobs everything else. So there's no overhead on the, on the functions that are being filtered. But if you don't do filtering, then the overhead is, uh, is quite high. Yeah. OK. All right. So yeah, if you have any questions, just send me an email or something. All right. Thanks.